Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 18th of July. I hope you're all having an absolutely fantastic day, enjoying the sunshine, a little bit of rain here or there, but mostly sunshine, uh, and that you have been well since we last spoke two weeks ago. So last uh, two weeks ago, if you remember, we were live from the Classical Association Conference uh, in London, and I was joined by a very special guest, Dr. May Musier, who uh, is a fellow trustee of Classics for All, uh, like me, but also as done incredible work uh, in classics outreach more generally and you may well be aware that uh, kind of at the end of the conference May was awarded the Classical Association Outreach Prize so she did incredibly well um, and fantastic congratulations to hers clearly uh, it's kind of a good thing to come on the podcast as a guest good things are in store and that is backed up also hello Alex hello Caroline hello Red Ruba. thank you so much for joining in that is backed up also by the fantastic news I heard this week hello Patricia that Katrina Kelly, who, if you remember, is the chair of the Lydon St Anne's Classical Association branch that I'm president of, and who has done an amazing job over the last five years from turning the Lydon St Anne's branch into one of the newest branches of the Classical Association into the largest branch of the Classical Association. And we have great fun going up there when I got there to do my presidential lecture in January time. And of course, this November, we have the exciting arrival of uh, Mary Beard coming to give her National Classical Association presidential lecture as well. Anyway, Katrina Katrina has just finished her finals uh, in classics at Oxford. And if you remember, she was a guest also on this podcast when I was up there in January. Hello, Debbie. Hello, Marion. And she has just found out that she is going to graduate with a first uh, in her degree in classics in Oxford. Bonjour, Bertrand. Ça va, ça va, ça va. J'espère que vous allez bien. Um, so it is clearly the absolutely fantastic, best possible way to do well uh, by coming on this podcast as a guest. So massive congratulations to Katrina. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And to May as well. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Laurie. Hello, Lil. How are you doing? Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. So we send our massive congratulations um, to both of them. Um, and uh, thank you also for getting in touch with all your fantastic news and where you're going and the fantastic photos you've been sending in. Don't forget, on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Michael Scott Academic, we have set up a summer 2019 uh, section where you can tell us all about the exciting things you're getting up to this summer and particularly, obviously, things that are classical or ancient related. So any exhibitions, any kind of particular sites, any places you get to, any books you read let us know what you're up to um over the summer sarah will we get to read her paper uh are you referring to katrina's katrina's dissertation on uh, gardens roman women and gardens which she got an absolutely stonking first class mark in she tells me uh well we'll have to ask katrina if she's willing to share a copy of her dissertation paper to share with us um and that would be absolutely fantastic and may's paper that she was giving at the session directly after we did the podcast last week which was thinking about classics and the 21st century, I believe those that is going to be made available um, as a series of podcasts. Hello, Patricia. Thank you so much. Hello, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining in. So we've had some great questions coming in from you um, over this week, and we're going to uh, uh, crack on with Colette Hutley, who has asked, do you believe ancient sites are victims of their own success? Thinking about tourism damage. So, uh, kind of, this is a really interesting question uh, about how do ancient sites both open themselves up to the public and make sure and kind of curate and feed that interest in the past without being overrun by them and while doing simultaneously their other important job which is about preserving them for the future. And you're absolutely right, Colette, that it is a really difficult balancing act. Um, the, the thing that was in the news this week, which is kind of got a lot of people very, very worried in Machu Picchu, thinking about the amazing side of Machu Picchu. And one of the things that makes that place so special, not just because of the site itself, but because traditionally it's been so hard to get to. Uh, and you have to trek there to the middle or you know, through the jungle to a certain extent. And there are harder and easier ways to get there with a bit of a train ride doing half the journey for you these days. But the new news is that they are building an international airport uh, very close to Machu Picchu so that people can fly in from all over the world um, and people who are looking after the site you know obviously that's going to increase tourism revenues so that's 
money's coming in, that's good, but the, they, they fear the site will be completely overwhelmed um, and that they just won't be able um, to preserve it and the area of the natural habitat around it, which from people who have done the trek uh, in fairly recent years have told me, you know, it's often there's a lot of rubbish strewn around, there's a lot of things that people who do the trek just kind of leave on the wayside rather than carrying with them. So that's a massive, massive problem. Um, Lil, Lily, uh, any advice about how to finish a PhD paper fast? Mine's about ancient tragedy and it's becoming a tragedy itself. Oh, PhD, finishing a PhD, uh, there's no way to sugarcoat this is probably the hardest thing you will ever do. So don't panic, right? And don't think it is out of the ordinary to feel utterly, utterly kind of spent trying to get to the end of it. The other really annoying thing about doing a PhD is that the last 2% of it normally takes 10% of the time because that's the tricky bit where you're crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, finding all the references, trying to bring it into as sharp a focus as you possibly can. I think the really important thing is to set yourself daily goals and to remember that you should think about writing a PhD like you write a job, like you're doing a job. It's a nine to five job. You should work from nine to five with a good lunch break in the middle, try and get something done, have your daily goals, but then walk away and have something else to do. Go and do some exercise, go and relax, go and read a book, whatever it might be, because otherwise you will completely lose your mind. Try and get into that regular habit, daily goals, nine to five working routine, and then have a nice calendar for yourself showing you how the daily goals get you to the end. Um, and then you know with each passing day that you are making progress. Uh, so kind of good luck, good luck. Let us know how it goes. Kind of really, really, we've got all fingers and toes crossed for you getting to the end of that. Thank you so much. Um, Rodrupa, you're more afraid of the constant vibration from the sound of flights coming to Machu Picchu. Yeah, absolutely. This is another major problem. And that affects quite a few archaeological sites in lots of different places uh, around the world. I mean, within the Aegean, for instance, uh, the island of Santorini, which is one of the most frequently visited tourist islands because of the extraordinary natural beauty of the island, but also because of its antiquity, uh, now kind of has more and more international flights flying directly to the tiny airport on the island, creating more and more um, tourism loads and problems. Um, in Athens, uh, kind of um, with the Acropolis, which we know, all know well and love, and which was Greece's first archaeological site back in the 1840s, uh, what I find fascinating is that every time I go there, they've changed the rules and regs about what you can and can't do up in the, on the Acropolis as they try to manage this continual problem of kind of containing people from doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And it does always amaze me when you go to an archaeological site and people are there and you see somebody picking something up. So you may remember in the paper there was the stories of, uh, I believe it was a British tourist <coughs> who was taking a bit of mosaic, found taking a bit of mosaic from one of the sites in Italy. But you see people uh, picking something up. You see people touching the stones or the ancient ruins. And if you approach them about it, Sometimes they'll say to you, well, it doesn't matter, it's just me, it's just one person, it's just me. Come on, I want my holiday to be special. I want my photo standing there on the other side of the barricade in the special roped off place. And of course, if it's just one person, it's not going to make that much difference. But one person saying it's just one person is exactly the same thing as is going to be said by the other 100,000 millions, in, in many cases, tourists that pass through every year. Um, and so I feel deeply for the guards on the sites uh, whose job it is to try and uh, get that across to people that without wanting to spoil their individual trip, they are but one person visiting and the rules can't be bent for them as it can't be bent for anyone else. Hello, Alexandra. Hello, Susan. Um, kind of thank you so much. So uh, in Athens, whenever you go up, so the things that are hilarious, when you next go up the Acropolis in, uh, in Athens to see the Parthenon, about halfway up the walkway up, there's a, there's a stone uh, kind of, uh, well, steely set up, inscribed on which are some of the rules about what you can and cannot do up on the Acropolis. Now, they obviously thought at some point it was worth inscribing these on stone rather than just on some kind of placard that could be more easily replaced. Um, but uh, look for it next time you're there because it's utterly hilarious that one of the rules on the inscribed on stone as you go up to the Acropolis is no naked photos in front of the monuments. So clearly, at some point in the past on the Acropolis, this was enough of a major problem that people were getting their kit off to take photos of themselves in front of the Parthenon that they felt the need to inscribe the rule on stone uh, not to do it. Now, obviously, this isn't going to necessarily damage 
uh, the monuments themselves, it may damage the, your appreciation of the day if you're up there as well, depending on who is taking their clothes off. And certainly the Greeks take it very seriously because they believe that doing that kind of posing in front of the monuments is actually disrespecting the monuments and their antiquity and their importance um, in the past. So uh, I've known particular times in Greek archaeological sites when you go up there and you're not even allowed to stand in front of the monument with your clothes on to have a photo uh, taken of yourself because that even that that is disrespecting the monument. You can only take a photo of the monument itself. I, mean, I think that's probably going a little bit far. On the Acropolis as well, one year I remember they didn't want you, they were trying to ban people from taking pens up there because clearly with pens people were writing. I mean, this is a horrible idea, isn't it? That people were writing on the monuments to sort of write their name. I was here. Um, as we know that people have done through time uh, because of all the graffiti that's on amazing uh, archaeological sites. And some of that graffiti is now historically uh, interesting in and of itself in Rome, if you go up the inside of Trajan's column, uh, you can act, there's a stairwell inside Trajan's column that spirals up to the top and then there's a little balcony area you can come out, out at the top. Inside, the, inside as you go up the spiral there's graffiti from all the people that have climbed that spiral uh, and it goes back through to the 10th century and there's a Pope, even a Pope graffitied his name on there uh, at one point saying I was here, I have. Ken, you've got an Acropolis confession. Ooh, oh dear, says Eliza. Ken. What is your Acropolis confession? Did you get naked in front of the Parthenon, Ken? Is that what you're going to reveal to us now? Please, please, please don't share the photo. Uh, kind of, we're trying to keep this Facebook feed very clean and for young audiences. Um, but uh, tell, us, tell us your confessions. Have you ever done anything at an archaeological site that you are no pr not proud of? We won't pass any of this to the police. This is a safe space for confessions. Byron, Alexis, yes, Byron signed his name at the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion as well. It was all part and parcel of what was thought was an acceptable way of behaving with these sites in the days of the Grand Tour and obviously cannot be sustained now in the era of mass tourism. There's another kind of element though to, to sites where they're the victims of their own success and that's where the, the actual site managers have attempted to uh, kind of recreate the landscape as it were and make it more um, authentic, more experiential. And this actually happened at Delphi back in the 1950s and 60s. They planted a whole series of trees at Delphi which has given it around the site today that kind of intense wooded feel that gives you that sense of that other world experience but they've actually more recently found that the particular variety of trees that they planted um, when rainfall comes down with the particular sap and the kind of things that come off those particular kinds of trees leading that water then dropping to the ground and washing over the stones it's having an increasingly acidic effect so we've got a problem there at Delphi, which they've been combating now for several years, uh, trying to make sure that stuff they've done to even augment the site doesn't then in turn do some damage to the site itself. Hello, Maria. Hello, hello, hello. Ken, come on, don't keep us waiting. What is your big Acropolis confession? Ah, as if you would. When I was a schoolboy, I asked a friend's granny to bring me back a piece of the Acropolis. Oh, God, I don't, I can't say. Aha, from her visit. Did she? Did she? I hope she didn't. And kind of like, and if so, you should absolutely return it right now. That's my official line on this subject. Thank you, Ken, for being kind of, this is a very open gang. Anyone else want to make any archaeological site confessions? They are more than welcome. Please, no, come on, let's not say for shame, Ken. He's very good to admit it. That was very brave. Well done, Ken, for admitting it. Although you haven't quite told us whether she did bring you back something or not. Um, but kind of, Colette, thank you so much for the question. So let us know. It was a lovely, lovely some way to stay. Oh, Ken. Oh, Ken, no, 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 no. Um, kind of, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anymore. Thank you very much. Knossos, another one from Naomi. Great point. Knossos over restored. Yeah, I mean, you know, this was in an era when the restorations on the one hand put Knossos on the map you know people were suddenly coming to see this place where Sir Arthur Evans had primarily taken over and used concrete to restore up to the second story and to recreate some of the frescoes and make it a really visible and perhaps more engaging and understandable site for the public tourist so kind of you can understand from one perspective why these things were done but on the other hand uh, obviously it's now has in some cases caused problems uh, I mean this used to be the case with the restoration of monuments more generally that they would restore uh 
one of the things they're doing in the Parthenon restoration project at the moment is actually spending a lot of time taking out some of the earlier restorations that were done, particularly in the 19th century, when they put things like iron clamps in uh, between the column drums. And of course, iron expands over time, which has ended up cracking the marble more. Um, so a lot of the kind of work that's done now on sites is often uh, taking away and repairing some of the old restoration work to put in place better restoration work that we now understand uh, kind of won't do further damage. Rajuba, I don't have a confession, but I did realize that the engraving is a kind of history in itself, yeah, where people have added in their names um, um, and uh, kind of from their own visits in times past, but let's not do that now. Perhaps we need to think of a kind of digital way of doing this. Perhaps there needs to be, you know, like you can check in on Facebook or wherever it might be at particular archaeological sites. Maybe archaeological sites need to invest in a kind of digital uh, board where people can say, I was here, um, and so that they can uh, kind of, people can, can, can enjoy kind of etching themselves into the past in that digital uh, rather than real way. So Colette, fantastic question. Let us know your confessions uh, over the Facebook page over the next week or so if you want to. And you can do it anonymously if you want to via email to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com um, and we'll, we'll post them anonymously, we promise. Um, so Colette, thank you so much indeed for that question. Time is flying by, wow, wow, wow. Um, Alison, Alison Barber has asked, here's a great question, were teenagers ever a thing in the ancient world? Teenagers teenagehood or as we've been recently learning with our three-year-old there is also the concept of a three-nager uh, after the terrible twos there is three-nager but the teenagers you're asking about Alison well, obviously, they went through the teenage years, although they didn't necessarily think about them uh, as, a, as a term. Right? Kind of, certainly, there wasn't the era of the teenager. Um, and the things that teenagers were doing then were often very, very different from uh, the, uh, the sorts of things that we expect teenagers to be doing now. I mean, girls, for instance, would be getting married as teenagers um, uh, immediately after or in the very soon after kind of having reached uh, puberty. So um, kind of boys equally would be kind of off training for war and fighting. Uh, they would uh, buy certainly by mid to late teens. Um, uh, but at the same time, there would have been some things that we do recognize from teenage life today. So education, uh, not for everyone within society, but certainly for the elites, that education would, would go through um, quite some uh, uh, through up to when they were considered to be a man. Um, for men, that kind of kind of emergence of a man, that kind of teenage experience, was often uh, defined a little bit by uh, kind of when your beard started appearing. Uh, in ancient Greece, obviously, there was also the pederastic relationship. So the kind of young boy in his mid to later teens was supposed to be in some kind of a relationship of exchange different kinds of exchange with an older man um, and it also depended where they were if they were in Athens uh, they might be kind of within a schooling environment but if they were in Sparta obviously during this period they were in the kind of a go-go the training school to turn them into Spartan warriors you, Anastasia you got told off for touching the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum quite right too if you honestly oh, touching the Rosetta Stone I know the feeling I know, I completely understand the feeling of being in touch with the past, with something physically in contact with the past. Trust me, it's one of the reasons that archaeologists do archaeology, is to have that kind of direct, very tactile connection with the past. But how can we do that en masse? That's the question. How can we figure out a way of doing that en masse um, without damaging the object? incredibly difficult to think of a way um, of doing that. Thank you, though, for the confession. Very good and very honest of you. Um, so yes, thinking about teenagers, uh, so they would also, perhaps more so than today, be going through special festivals and religious rites and rituals of transition. Uh, so for girls, this would be uh, immediately after puberty. So in, in Athens, they would have the festivals at Artemis Brauronia, where we know young girls went to spend some time as, as servants of the goddess Artemis and particularly dressed up as bears. And it was all kind of quite weird and wacky um, before coming back into society, uh, seemingly kind of grown up as adults. Um, and for boys equally, there was a whole series of uh, kind of uh, maturation rituals. Uh, so, so yeah, there's lots of kind of different, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? There's lots of aspects of the life that we would recognise, uh, as teenagers would recognise. Uh, the, the kind of rituals they go through have changed quite substantially. I don't think we have too many people getting dressed up as bears now um, on a night out. 
maybe I'm just out of touch. Maybe the onesie craze from a couple of years ago was, was sort of bringing that back in a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, equally, I think things nowadays that most teenagers would be very glad they don't have to face was uh, were, were very much the norm for ancient teenagers. Um, and it's interesting, the ancient Greek world, I mean, when you look at ancient Greek statuary, for instance, the kind of mid to late teens uh, was really thought of as the kind of acme of male physical perfection. So this was the moment, you know, when you look at all the, the Koroi statues and the young male statues, they're all at that, that moment of youthful beauty, late teenager, the Kalos Kagathos moment, as it's known, beautiful and good, both inner good, moral good, and exterior beauty all wrapped up into one. If you want to know more about teenagehood, then I really recommend Ray Lawrence. Uh, if you Google on YouTube, uh, Ray Lawrence, because he has done a series of brilliant um, animated videos. So he uh, writes the script and, and uh, is the speaker, but they've then been animated and it's all part of a TEDx exercise. Um, so Ray Lawrence, have a look. And he has actually got one. I saw today, uh, glimpses of teenage life in ancient Rome. So you can catch that as well. That kind of, that'd be absolutely fantastic to have a look at. So we have very quickly a little bit of time for kind of, oh, you're still giving your confessions. Excellent news. Ex With shorter lifespan, did puberty happen earlier at the same age as now? Yes, puberty you happening earlier. So 12, um, kind of uh, 11, 12, kind of was definitely thought of as normal time uh, as we're going through puberty and then kind of marriage by 13, 14, 15 max. Yeah. And kind of things like that um kind of so in the news from the independent so here you go if you want to get away from it all a greek island is willing to pay families 450 pounds a month to live there that's about 500 euros because in an effort to combat its dwindling population it's the island of antikythera um which is an absolutely gorgeous island and it sounds brilliant apparently it just has 24 permanent residents which swells slightly during the summer months um it's on the website they call it one of the tiniest non-modernized inhabited Greek islands. There's limited food shopping, limited resources, but unlimited relaxation. There you go. So if you'd like to apply, we'll put the link up on the web page. Um, then you must have seen this as well. Dolce & Gabbana went absolutely nuts uh, in Shaka and Agrigento, kind of down insistently recently, when they had their epic Alta Moda show, where it was all based on antiquity and high fashion. They actually did the fashion show in and amongst the temples, the Valley of the Temples in Agrigento, which it looks extraordinary, um, some of the clothes that they came up with. I don't think even I, as a committed classicist, uh, would want to uh, spend uh, that much time in some of the outfits they created, but maybe I just don't get high fashion. Rodrupa, that's your retirement plan. Brilliant retirement plan. I love it. We'll see you all there. Um, from The Guardian, piece of skull found in Greece, oldest human fossil outside Africa. And this is really interesting. It's very early days. Lots of more tests need to be done. There's calls for lots more investigations, but a piece of skull has been found down in the Mani Peninsula, which dates to 210,000 years old. A human skull, Homo sapien skull, uh, with the oldest um, skull of Homo sapien uh, in Europe. It's older by about 160,000 years. So it's complete, if this is proved true, it's completely going to rewrite the story of when we think Homo sapiens spread up out of Africa and into Europe in particular kind of looking forward to hearing about that and then if you're in the UK Derbyshire live treasure hunters are flocking to Derbyshire after the discovery of a Roman settlement so there you go if you want to do some digging over this summer get to it absolutely um kind of uh things what's on if you're in Rome I mentioned this on Twitter and we put it on the Facebook page as well they've opened up the tunnels beneath the baths of Caracalla if you can get there get there we filmed there from Italy's invisible cities when we were doing um the pro and and Rome's Invisible City, the very first of the series of Alexander Armstrong, and it is incredible. I mean, it's an underground motorway system. There's even an underground roundabout big enough for all the wagons and carts coming in, bringing all the material that was needed to unload, then move around the roundabout to head off again um, to keep the bars running. And the underground systems are just phenomenal. You imagine the thousands of people that were toiling away underneath underground to make those baths all nice um, for people to visit and spend some time in. You're going to, uh, Eliza's going to Rome soon. Get there. Get them. Book in now. Right. 
Linda Montague asked about humour. How has humour changed over the millennium? How long have we got? We've got five or so minutes to spend on this. I promised you some ancient Greek jokes, so I'm going to do some ancient Greek joke telling, if I possibly can. So first off, you asked how has humour changed over the millennium? Did the uh, ancient Greeks portray humour in their plays and books differently from others? Others. Uh, or did the Romans? So there's been some really interesting studies uh, on humour, or ancient Greek and Roman humour. So uh, in the Roman world, I really recommend Mary Beard's written about Roman. Roman laughter um, and in the Greek world we've got Stephen Halliwell has written a book on Greek laughter and if you happen to want to do a degree in classics at Warwick University we have a module led by one of my colleagues Victoria on Roman laughter as well so there's plenty uh, to be done and to be read and to be thought about um, ancient or Greek and Roman humour. Has it changed much? Yes and no, <laughs> as, as ever the question. Um, if you look at comedy, for example, from the Greek world and look at old comedy, so Aristophanes and his plays, um, and you can see some examples of his plays, actual productions of them, if you look at our Warwick Classics website um, and look at particularly the Warwick Classics network and then through to the Drama Festival page where we have videos of the plays put on each year by our students, several of which have been Aristophanic comedies. Hello from sunny Cornwall, Amanda. Thank you so much for tuning in. The... Uh, Humour in old comedy is intensely political and related to the politics of the day. So the modern comparison would be, have I got news for you, mock the week, um, you think it's all over, that kind of stuff. It, it, you need to know about the politics of who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down, what people have got up to, whether Boris Johnson has been flapping around a kipper in the air or whatever, to be able to get uh, all the inside jokes of old comedy. That makes it actually quite difficult for us to uh, understand completely those plays today but by the time you get into uh, and yes minister as well Reggie but absolutely kind of really great one yeah um kind of you remember Sarah's talking about remember the oldest Roman written fa oldest found written joke was from Roman era and was a mother-in-law joke ah ah well hang on I'm going to introduce you to a text in a second the Philogelos the laughter lover which is a collection from the third century AD of uh, jokes of ancient jokes going all the way back to ancient Greece hello Beatrice from the Czech Republic hello thank you so much for tuning in um so uh but new comedy on the other hand which was a uh, most famous playwright of which is Menander gives a whole different kind of comedy. It's much more situational comedy. Uh, it's kitchen sink drama. It's stock characters, like there's a play called by Menander called The Grumpy Old Man, who does the grumpy old man thing. So think uh, one foot in the grave. Right, so a very two types of humour that we have both of which we have today, uh, but they were much more chronological in the sense that uh, Athens in particular seemed to move from liking the political comedy to the wider, more appealing situation comedy that then could be shown in theatres all around the ancient world and still be applicable. Um, and then in the Roman world, you even got the development of pantomime, uh, kind of as a as a, the ultimate expression of a art form that could be shown anywhere because you didn't even need to understand a language to be able to understand it because it was all physical uh, humour and physical comedy. So that's why pantomime took off so well in the Roman Empire because it could be transported everywhere. But here we go. Right, the Philogelos. 265 jokes surviving from antiquity. And what I love about this is that all these jokes have as the, the butt of them a particular stock character. And one of those is the intellectual. Yes, the academics, we can take the mick out of ourselves. Okay, although kind of it's an intellectual who sort of is just trying to, basically all the jokes are the intellectual trying to be too clever. So here you go. Here's a joke for you. An intellectual got a slave pregnant. At the birth, his father suggested that the child be killed. The intellectual replied, first murder your own children and then tell me to kill mine. I don't know how joke telling is going to work on Facebook Live, given I have to wait a little bit to see what your reactions to these jokes may be. Uh, kind of, but there we go. Uh, another intellectual joke. An intellectual came to check in on a friend who was seriously ill. When the man's wife said that he had departed, the intellectual replied, well, when he arrives back, will you tell him that I stopped by? Okay. Uh-huh. Um, here we go. Okay, there is another intellectual one, but anyone young listening needs to close their ears uh, right now. Three, two, one. Okay. An intellectual during the night ravished his grandmother and for this got a beating from his father. He complained. 
You've been mounting my mother for a long time without suffering any consequences from me, and now you're mad that you found me screwing your mother. Intellectuals, eh? Academics. Right, another kind of stock character that comes out of this one, uh, jokesters. So they're jokesters. Even joke tellers could take the mick out of themselves, which I quite like. Uh, again, young ones, turn away your ears. Turn away your ears. Uh, when a jokester who was a shopkeeper... I have to say this one's quite good. That's not a very good joke-telling line, is it, to say it's a good joke before you've told the joke. But here we go. When a jokester who was a shopkeeper found a policeman screwing his wife, he said, I got something I wasn't bargaining for. Boom, boom, cha. Uh, here's a more kind of uh, family-friendly one. A jokester went abroad. There he developed a hernia. Coming home, he was asked if he had brought a present back. Nothing for you, he said. Just a headrest for my thighs. <laughs> and then the final kind of stock character that we've got on here. Yes, carry on gone crazy. Thank you, Linda. Yes, indeed. Maybe you should have listened when you said... Maybe you should have listened when you said to close your ears, Eliza. Yes, sorry. You can't take that back now, can you? Um, the final stock character, incompetence. Okay, um, an incompetent school teacher who asked was asked. Well, I'll start that again. An incompetent school teacher was asked who the mother of Priam was. Not knowing the answer, he said, "It's polite to call her mom." Uh, a friend, uh, sorry, a man just back from a trip abroad went to an incompetent fortune teller. He asked about his family, and the fortune teller said, "Everyone is fine, especially your father." When the man objected that his father had been dead for 10 years, the reply claimed, you have no clue who your real father is. <laughs> uh, okay, I quite like that one. Uh, you can also have an incompetent astrologer. Here we go, here's the final one. An incompetent astrologer cast a boy's horoscope and he said he will be a lawyer, then a city official, then a governor. But when this child died, the mother confronted the astrologer. He's dead, the one you said was gonna be a lawyer and an official and a governor. By his homely memory, the incompetent astrologer replied, if he had lived, he would have been all of those things. There you go. There are some real ancient Greek jokes for you. The Philogelos. Uh, if you Google it, you can have a look at lots more. Um, I, particularly, I think the incompetent or the jokester ones get it. Not that I'm kind of sensitive about the intellectual, but I don't find those particularly funny. Um, but the jokester and the incompetent. So you can, uh, there you go. You can tell some ancient Greek jokes to your friends uh, over dinner uh, this weekend. Thank you so much. Our time is up. What a wonderful kind of great, 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 great comments from you guys today. Keep them coming. Keep the questions coming in. Now, the next two weeks we won't be able to have a Q&A because next Thursday I'm actually going up to Doncaster to check in on an archaeological dig that's happening right now which is part of a very special project working with people, vulnerable people who are suffering from all kinds of problems um, and the project is actually using archaeology and using the discipline of archaeology to help get them back on their feet so I'm really looking forward to seeing more about that project and I'm hoping to work more with them in the future I look forward to telling you more about that in the future and then the week after that um, I am away on holiday uh, with the family. So we're going to leave this for three weeks. So the next time I see you is going to be, hang on a sec, I've got it written down somewhere. It is, next time is the 8th of August. So we will be here Thursday, 8th of August for the next Q&A. Keep the questions coming in over that time period. Have a great time on your holidays if you're going on a holiday in the meantime. Enjoy the weather this weekend. I hope the rain stays away. And thank you, as always, for being absolutely and utterly fantastic. Have a great rest of the week. Take care.